Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Harriet Hodginson. She or Hodgson, excuse me. She is a fitness and health writer for the past 37 years. And she's going to talk to us today about Smiling Through Your Tears, which is her book on anticipating grief. And then hopefully if we have enough time, we're going to talk a little bit about one of her caregiving guides, which is Affirmations for Family Caregivers. So thanks for joining me, Harriet. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about, oh, you're welcome. Tell me a little bit about you first, because you've had more caregiving in your life than most of us, which is good for us, but not necessarily for you. That's true. Uh, I never thought that I was going to be a long-term caregiver, but um, my mother developed something called vascular dementia, which according to her physician really added up to Alzheimer's disease. Um, I moved her kicking and screaming to our hometown of Rochester, Minnesota, and I was her family caregiver for nine years. She didn't live with us, thank goodness, because I don't think that would have worked out too well. But um, I did something for her every day. I found, first of all, a place for her to live. I made sure that her apartment had everything that she needed. Um, I took her to medical and dental appointments, filled prescriptions, uh, we had a lunch day, we had a shopping day, we had an errand day. Uh, every Sunday, I cooked a gourmet meal for her, and she came to our house. Uh, sometimes I did her laundry, um, although there were a lot of facilities available to her. And this went on for nine years. What I was not prepared for was... First of all, the exhaustion that I felt after nine years. But the other thing is just the sheer shock and hurtfulness of having your mother not recognize you. And at the end, not only did she not recognize me, she thought I was a stranger who had come to harm her. Mm. So I went to visit her. I had transferred her to nursing care because... Uh, she threatened to go back to the state of New York to be with friends. Every friend that she mentioned was deceased. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was a jolt in itself. Um, but at the end, I realized she was not going to die in peace unless I left her alone. When I approached her, she would grunt. Uh, she couldn't speak by then. And she would push me away. So after nine years of that, I realized that I was physically and emotionally exhausted. And I thought, well, life is going to calm down and I'm going to regroup and I'm going to get my energy back. Only that didn't happen. Yeah, famous last um, words. <laughs> right. And some energy came back, but I realized I was really, really exhausted. Well, not long after that, um, I'm not sure, you know, of the interval, but in 2007, our uh, daughter was killed in a car crash. She died from the injury she received in the car crash. She was the mother, and of course always will be the mother, of our twin grandchildren. Um, as it happened, our granddaughter was in the car with her mother, and so Helen suffered life-threatening injuries. Surgeons operated on her for 20 hours, but could not save her life. And our granddaughter had a mild concussion. Two days after that, my father-in-law succumbed to pneumonia at age 98 and a half. Ooh. And I had been expecting his death. I had felt anticipatory grief. But you know, death is so final. And when he died, it was a huge jolt. I, I just wasn't prepared and also wasn't prepared for two deaths on the same weekend. And when I opened the local newspaper and saw two family photos, I just sobbed uncontrollably. I just didn't know if I would ever be able to survive that. 
And again, I thought, well, I'll, I'll admit my feelings. I'll go through some grief here. I'm going to come out on the other side, okay. But then in the fall of the same year, the twin's father died in another car crash. And then and eight weeks after that, um, well, my brother died. Excuse me. He died before uh, the twin's father. So we had four deaths, four significant deaths in six months. And fortunately, um, I had experienced death before, in grief before, with the grief of parents and aunts and uncles and beloved pets and and dear friends, you know, I had been through that. And I, I remember one day meeting a friend downtown and I said, you know, I have the strangest feelings. I have this feeling that a black cloud is following me everywhere I go. I'm really nervous and anxious and all these feelings mixed up. And it turns out she was a grief counselor. And she said, oh, Harriet, you are going through anticipatory grief. Now, this was at the time that uh, everyone was still alive. And that got me studying anticipatory grief. And I studied it for a dozen years. And that eventually led to the book, Smiling Through Your Tears. But what's so fascinating, Jen, is I had other books that had been published. I had been published by major publishers. So I wrote a book proposal, actually wrote an outline, sent it to a major publisher in New York, and I was sure it was going to get accepted. And I waited and waited. Finally, I called and I talked to a young editor and I could tell she was young by her voice. And I talked to her, I said, gee, you know, what do you think about the idea of smiling through your tears? And she said, I don't get it. <laughs> and then she said, I just don't get it. And I, I could tell that grief was not in her life experience yet. I couldn't make her get it. No way. But I could follow her advice. She said, you know, if you want to get this published, I recommend you find a physician co-author and see if that helps you. Well, by then the book was finished. As I said, I researched it for a dozen years. I kept refining and you know, revising the outline. But I followed her advice and I approached a psychiatrist uh, who lived in our neighborhood. And she said she'd love to join in on the book, that uh, it, it was interesting to her. And so basically she vetted the book and she added some extra copy where she thought it was necessary, but basically she vetted it. And I thought, boy, we've got a winner now. Only nobody was interested in a book about anticipatory grief. And yet everyone goes through it. Everyone goes through this. If you have a child born with a heart defect, if you have a kid on drugs, if a kid has run away, um, if they're showing uh, worrisome behaviors, if you hear that your company is downsizing, I mean, the list goes on and on. Sooner or later, we all feel anticipatory grief. And finally, I thought, I'm tired of approaching publishers. Um, pub the publishing industry was going through an upheaval at the time. And so we published it through Amazon, and it has sold very well. And there's even a chapter in there uh, about the anticipatory grief of terrorism because 9-11 happened while we were finishing the book. <laughs> well, you can probably revise it now to anticipating a pandemic or, you know, dreaded diseases. Exactly. Uh -huh. So how you have experienced so well, much. That's a good point, Jen, because while all... Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say all the people who are sheltering in place or self-quarantining actually are going through anticipatory grief. But many people have never heard the term, and I should maybe define what it is. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, it is a feeling of loss and grief before a death happens, but this is most important, or before a dreaded event happens. And my co-author, Dr. Lois Cron, a Mayo Clinic psychiatrist, added that phrase to the definition, a dreaded event. And that would certainly fit the pandemic now. <laughs> it's been an interesting year, that's to say, putting it mildly. How do mm -hmm. you, do you have a tip on how how not to walk around waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I say that because 2017 started out with the death of one of my dogs. Well, my dad came home on hospice, death of a dog, daughter moved out, father died, put mom in memory care. That was all in the first two and a half months, January, February, yeah, two and a half months of 2017. Okay. You know, I had just turned 50, not terribly unreasonable to expect some major life things happening, just not necessarily all in two months. That would have been, spreading it out would have been nice, which I'm sure you can relate to. And then 2020 starts, and we, my husband and I decided, we were looking at the winds of change, <laughs> and we decided, you know, we had a very large, very expensive house. And we're both self-employed, so it's like, you know what? It's going to be a whole lot easier to downsize the expenses into the barest minimum of our income instead of continuously stressing and trying to grow his business to meet our expenses. So we sold our quote-unquote forever home, and that happened like in a day. So we went from Christmas Day deciding we were going to do it to officially closing on January 24th. So that was bonkers. My mom was going through a lot of difficulties. She'd fallen on December 30th and it wasn't revealed until um, she broke her leg in March that she'd also fractured her pelvis in that probably in that fall. So we were dealing with a lot of stress with her. And then, then the pandemic hits, she's in the hospital. I'm like, do I want to go to the hospital? Do I want her at the hospital? And she, was released and I was dealing with all of that and I was fairly certain she would not do the physical therapy needed to walk again and I, I was I had I was fine with that I actually had some positive reasons for thinking it would be okay and even though she'd been on the Alzheimer's journey for about 20 years I was not ready for them to call me and say she's not going to make it to the end of the day and she passed away on March 31st. So I quote unquote jokingly tell people that I'm just going to self-medicate, sedate myself for the first quarter of 2023, because apparently every three years, my life goes upside down. <laughs> and I know I try not to mention that because I don't want it to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. But you must, you must have some tips on how not to feel that way, because my goodness, have you gone through it? Well, I think, first of all, I would encourage people to be on the lookout for anticipatory because that can be empowering. And anticipatory grief is very unique. And the re what makes it unique, first of all, your thoughts, and, and this has probably happened to you, your thoughts jump around from the past to the present to the future. And they're jumping around all the time. And you may even have trouble following your own thoughts because they're jumping around. Of course, it's uncompleted loss. You're already starting to feel grief, already feeling lost, but you're grieving for someone who hasn't died. So that makes it complicated. Then you've got the emotional component, all these emotions that are flooding through you, and, and you've certainly gone through that with your mom. Not to mention moving, which is one of the most stressful things you can do in life. That's another program. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> then there's the time factor. The time factor, because I was my mother's caregiver for nine years, and nine years of watching someone disintegrate uh, takes a toll on you. Uh, then you've got suspense and fear, which is always part of your day, because you say, is this the day? my loved one is going to die. And you kind of try to prepare yourself 
um, it's can be very complex. Anticipatory grief can be more complex than post-death grief, uh, especially if there are other things going on in your life. But the most unique thing about it is the feeling of sorrow mixed with hope. You always have hope. So you think, oh, well, maybe the doctor made the wrong diagnosis or um, Maybe we're going to meet a wonderful therapist who is going to be able to help mom. And uh, I went through this with my own husband, who is paraplegic now. And he, too, fractured his pelvis when a professional caregiver was with him. And it set him back a year and a half. And so now, with the help of a talented and very skillful, compassionate therapist, we almost have him back to where he was, which is being able to stand and take a few steps uh, to where he was before he fractured his pelvis. But I think you people need to be on the lookout for that. And I think you always have to have a plan A and a plan B. And so there's, I tend to be an independent person. I have a caregiving type of personality. Uh, thank God, I suppose. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with calling up a friend and saying, you know, I'm really down today. Could I just talk with you for a few minutes? And, you know, just having coffee or, you know, just even walking in a park with a friend can boost your spirits. Uh, even though you're busy at this time of life and finding your way through anticipatory grief, it may be a t good time to get a physical exam. Uh, physical exams have changed a lot with modern medicine, especially now with telemedicine. Everybody is, you know, they have to call their patients, which isn't working that well, I, I would say, but having been one of the patients who was called, but uh, and it, it does help to, to check on your, your own health every so often. And uh, I know I found out that I absolutely have to have a sleep routine. If I don't have a sleep routine, and if I don't get seven hours at least a night, I'm no good the next day. I'm not a good caregiver. I'm grumpy. I say things I wish I hadn't said. I eat stuff I shouldn't eat. Now, I will admit, I had apple pie for breakfast yesterday, and it was, <laughs> it was very good. I thought of pie a la mode, but I didn't want to overdo it, so <laughs> I had apple pie. <laughs> now, that sounds like something I'd threaten to do, but you got the fruit, so okay. Maybe a little more sugar than you needed, but uh -huh. it wasn't chocolate pie, which probably is pure junk. Yeah. At least the apples are reasonable. <laughs> uh -huh. Did you have an egg with it? Apples. So, so I didn't hear you. Um, did you you didn't happen to have an egg with your apple pie, did you? <clears throat> did we lose each other? Oh, no, I just oh. had plain apple pie. Just plain yeah, apple pie. Your sound broke up just a little bit. I think our yeah. internet connection's a little bit weak. Although neither one of us have gotten the message that it's weak, so too many people are on Zoom apparently right now. <laughs> uh -huh, I figured that out. Yes, that's been an issue since this pandemic started. I've been teasing people that they need to get off the Zoom because it's screwing up my life. Yeah, I was going to say because you need to get on. <laughs> yeah, I've been using Zoom for a, like 18 months, almost two years. So the rest of the world just needs to like share better. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so I did talk several months ago, probably over a year ago. All the uh, time is becoming hard to keep track of right now <laughs> about anticipatory yeah. grief. And this was before I knew about your book. And so this is, we're going to dive into it a, a little further, but I know with my mom's passing and it being what felt sudden, I mean, I, thought I was prepared. So I was shocked that I was not quite as prepared when it happened. I mean, it really did happen kind of rapidly. The broken leg was the last 
straw that her body could deal with or not deal with apparently um it's what what steps should people take to you said to be aware of it and and kind of work their way through it that that's positive and beneficial well it, as surprising as this seems anticipatory grief may help you in several important ways and the first thing uh, i actually list all of these in my books uh our book, I should say, with Dr. Lois Cron, in our book, Smiling Through Your Tears. And it can be a rehearsal for post-death emotions. And this will help you contain emotions if you have to contain them a bit later on. But rehearsing uh, doesn't hurt. You, you know, you kind of know what to expect. I have seen cases where families that were fractured uh, mended themselves. The, the family members came closer together and started to work as a team. Um, you may take proactive measures. For example, make sure that your loved one's will is current. Uh, my husband and I redid our wills uh, not that long ago, but Minnesota law has already changed. And we had to go and update our wills, which took longer than I thought. Hmm. Uh, so that's a good thing to do. The other thing is you might want to bring up painful topics. I had a friend who told a story about her family. Somebody loved a painting so much in a relative's house that when the, when the relative was in the hospital uh, really uh, um, doing poorly, they went into her home and stole the painting, if you can believe that. People I can. That. Yeah. But the point is that maybe it is time to talk about who gets what. Ask your loved one, you know, what, what do you want to give to people? And you may not want to give anything. You may want to give your treasured collection to a museum, whatever. Um, I found I, I am an empathetic person. I mean... Listen, Jello commercials can make me cry. So <laughs> I am empathetic, but I became more empathetic because of anticipatory grief. I was appreciative of the community services that I, I hadn't known about them. I called social services and, and they gave me wonderful advice. And they said, Harriet, it's time to arrange for your mother's death now pay the expenses, whatever. Um, and so then you don't have to do that at a time when you were stressed. And that turned out to be excellent advice. So I was grateful for that. I think having anticipatory grief for nine years, and I also had it uh, when my husband's aorta dissected uh, in 2013, but I know what is important and what is not. And I make these decisions very quickly. I mean, is this really crucial to my life or can you just let it go? Don't, don't clutter your mind with stuff like that. I also learned how to do a better job of living the moment. Mindfulness is a big trend these days, but if you've tried it, it takes a lot of effort. You got to keep your mind on the moment and what is happening and the sights and the sounds and the smells and the colors and the feelings, all of that, and your own body. But uh, it became easier for me to do that. And some experts, and this is true of me, think that if you let yourself feel anticipatory grief, then your post-death grief is shorter. And that happened to me because I had been grieving for my mother for nine years. And in a, in a sense, I was grieved out. <laughs> um, you know, I just, uh, I figured, you know, I adored her. I took care of her right up to the end. I did everything that I could possibly do to protect her. I monitored her finances. I made her remaining money come out even with her death which was quite a feat, let me tell you, because uh, she had been defrauded of $50,000. And so now coming 
to the end of how anticipatory grief may help you, you can start to think of ways to make good things from grief. And that made me decide I'm going to write some grief resources for people. Uh, and that's how I can help people. And while I have been at home in our apartment here, um, I had started a workbook for kids that are grieving. Actually, there are two, one for young kids, one for ages four to eight, one for older kids, ages eight to 12. We were, the publisher and I were just about to send the first one to press when the pandemic hit and she's, you know, put it on hold. But according to the publisher, she says these books are, quote, amazing. I'm surprised so they're I'm on very... hold. Oops, sorry. I, I forgot there's a lag. I'm well, surprised they put them on hold in this time frame because I would think kids have lost a lot, especially teenagers have lost a lot of their um, rites of passage with proms and graduations and you know, everybody's lost something, vacations, postponed yeah. weddings, but you don't right. get back your graduation time. I mean, even if they do it later in the year, it's, it's past. And once we yeah, get to July 1st, it's over. Well, the, yeah, well, the problem was one financial because uh, all publishers, I think, are cut, cutting back a bit. You don't know what's going to happen. But the other is that they are workbooks for kids. So you have to have an actual printed book in order to complete the pages. It can't be an electronic book. I suppose it could be electronic and people could download it, but I'm not running her company. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the books and eager to see them in print. And every, every book is a learning experience and I was going to make them longer and she said to me, well, you know, this size, 20 pieces of paper on either side, this size is what kids will work on. If it gets longer than that, they won't do it. She said, we've learned that from experience. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it probably so looks I, overwhelming. Anyway, yeah. So I'm, I, I'm glad I did those, and I'm still trying to make good things from grief. And... I give talks that extend my books. I give uh, free workshops. I, I do all that. Um, my motto is have clean underwear, we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's a so, new one on me. <laughs> <laughs> I found my biggest grief after mom passed was not that she passed. Cause I was like, okay, she's in a much better place now wherever that may be. And, yeah. but it was more of a sadness for what should have been. She should have been able to hang out with her three grandkids. And when I say that, I, I really kind of mean the younger two is my daughter's 28 and a half and my niece is 14 and a half and her brother's 11. So she's obviously not going to hang out with the adult granddaughter who works full time as much as she would with the younger ones. And they didn't get the good years with her. So when I say hang out with the grandkids, that's kind of what I mean. And she should travel with her friends and decorate her house however she wanted. But no, that was not meant to be. And that's, that's kind of where the, the grief kind of happened for me is more of a what should have been. And I'm, I'm glad that she went when she did because not being able to see her, I did get to see her the day before she passed. Um, I'm assuming she knew I was there. And then we saw her the day she died, but she'd already left us. And, you know, with all of this insanity going on, not being able to go there and spend the time with her was challenging. And I was concerned she would forget me and not trust me. She thought I was her best friend. And I didn't want to lose that, which from what you said with your mom, I'm, I'm glad I didn't experience that. That, that would be difficult, but that, that's where the grief was. And the last couple of days, she keeps popping into my head with like, I wish we were doing this, or I wish we were doing that. Just the normal things that she and I did, like going to the park and watch kids. So it's kind of weird. 
we're having you lost a future with her you lost a future yeah and i i did expect i i did expect that she would be okay and that she would be in a wheelchair which would give me a lot more control over her which she probably wouldn't have liked but it would have made things easier yeah and so i i was you know i had a let's see i'd mentally thought through all of that and what how it might play out. So when they called and said, mom's not doing very well, we think she'd benefit from a visit from you. I was like, great. This two weeks with not seeing her at all is really concerning me. And then I saw her and I was like, oh yeah, we're not going to the park. This is, mm -hmm. this is not a good thing. So I was, it was a little bit of a shock because I hadn't seen her for two weeks. So that might've been part of it. But you know, when you stack all of the major life events moving upending our life because i also kind of almost completely retired from my photography business um well i kind of have because i can't do it right now and you know it's just there was a lot of things going on and then her death and then and then you can't even do a celebration of life right now and it's just like oh it's crazy mm -hmm. and then i have a 12 and a half year old dog and so I am, I'm like, you have to make it till next year, dude, because I don't have any more bandwidth for any more crap this year. <laughs> yeah. And 12 and a half is old for a golden retriever. So, well, yeah, I love golden retrievers. We always had goldens. <clears throat> they're, they're great dogs. I have three. Yeah. Um, so let's pivot slightly to a more positive. Not that, not that anticipatory grief is negative, because like you said, it does have some benefits. But I liked your book, the, your guide, your affirmations for family caregivers. What was the, the motivation or the inspiration for that? You have how many caregiving books? Five guides? Four. four. Well, I have four in a family caregiver series. And then I had uh, a book, So You're Raising Your Grandkids. Uh, that has won several awards. And then um, my latest is called The Grandma Force. And uh, <laughs> that one uh, won a, a silver medal. So um, I didn't get up one day and say, I'm going to write a series of books for family caregivers. It just happened. So I started the one, the family caregivers guide. And at this time I had just started being my husband's caregiver. So I've been his caregiver. It's the fifth year. And this is my 23rd year as a caregiver. <laughs> That's a long and time. Because my twin grandchildren lo lost both parents, the court, appointed us as their guardians and caregivers. So we did that for seven years. So we relived the uh, teenage years, <laughs> which was a riot. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And they both graduated from college with high honors and Phi Beta Kappa. And then again, I thought life is, is going to calm down uh, and I'm going to be coasting. I'm just going to coast now. And then my husband's aorta dissected and I became his caregiver the night I drove him to the emergency room. So um, I, I was sitting around one day and I thought, you know, there must be other people like me in similar situations and maybe even worse situations. So I, you know, after I wrote the family caregiver's guide, um, I wrote affirmations for family caregivers and I was work. I, I write every day and I was at the computer and I thought, you know, I really think an affirmation a day keeps the blues away. So I'll write an affirmation and I wrote an affirmation and that got me on, uh, in the habit of writing an affirmation. So I kept writing and I started a computer file. And then before I knew it, I had so many, you know, the file was bigger and bigger. And so I approached my publisher at that time, said, would you be interested in this? And she said, yes. And we divided the affirmations into categories. Like um, loving my loved one is one category. Uh, Self-care is another category. Health and wellness 
is another category. And uh, I researched affirmations before I wrote the book and I came across some experts and one expert said, well, just fake it till you make it. I think that's dangerous advice because you could lie to yourself. And then you make up, wake up one day and say, gee, you know, I've been really faking it too much. And, and this is where I actually am in life. Another said to uh, write about what you hope will happen. Well, I didn't think that was good advice because it turns every affirmation into a goal. And uh, you could overwhelm yourself with goals. And I thought, why don't I affirm the life that I am living now? And so that is what Affirmations for Family Caregivers is. And there are different categories of caregiving. So you can turn to the one that you need the most. And at the end, it gives you tips for writing your own affirmations. And I recommend one sentence affirmations because you can just put one sentence on a little note, stick it in your pocket and make it your mantra for the day. And that book closes with the affirmation that caregiving is love in action. And I think of that every day, that mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't been easy. Uh, I'm learning how to be a nurse the hard way, you know, step by step. Um, no college education, just on the job training. But caregiving is love in action. And that's what I think of every day when I get up. And the other thing I think of is the fact that I am alive in, is a miracle itself. I have survived uterine cancer had surgery for that. I had open heart surgery last May, on the 5th of May, a historic day, and I now have a pig valve in my heart. And the fact that I am alive and the fact that my husband is alive after having his aorta dissect are two miracles and it's tributes to outstanding medical care. So when I get up in the morning, I say, how can I make the most of the miracle of my life? Because it is a miracle. And so that is my goal each day. Keeps me writing. <laughs> Keeps me going. And you've been writing for 37 years, is that correct? Uh, well, it's now approaching 39. Oh, my goodness. That's a lot of years. And how many thousand, total books? Thousand, uh, 38. My 39th book is in production now. I got a co-author for that. It's a, a book about leadership for young children. And we're very excited about it. I contacted a leadership uh, person in my community uh, who has her own company and get, does leadership training. And uh, we're very excited about this book. The illustrator is uh, finishing, has just finished the cover. It's going to be wonderful. I think this is a book that spans all ages, that it, it, it could be a book for a child, even though it's a children's book, but you could give it to a work colleague, uh, you know, who is a leader, or you could even give it to yourself. I think it's going to span all ages. Well, I think we could definitely use more help with teaching people how to be leaders, because I don't feel that that's a skill set that's working for us right now. Our leaders, too many of them, the most visible ones, don't seem to be leading in the right direction or for the right motivations. And other right. people kind of seem to sit around and wait for other people to tell them which way to go. Which right. you know, none and of those I, things are my personality at all. <laughs> I no, just, well, and... and it's funny you should say that because, I mean, when I had all these deaths in a row, I thought, well, I have two choices here. I can sit around and wait to be rescued, fat chance of that happening, or I can take action myself. And I remember, you know, it, it's interesting to me, our loved ones are gone, but we still learn from them each day. We remember something they said, we remember something they did, a happy memory, a laugh you shared. I remember my mother telling me one day that the good fairy isn't coming. And she didn't tell me that to quell my belief in fairies. 
She wanted me to know that I was the good fairy and that I was responsible for myself. And I thought of that after I suffered the multiple losses. And I thought, I am going to be my own good fairy. I have the strength to do this. I'm going to do it. And whatever it takes, I am going to survive this. And um, it, it resulted actually in far more books than I thought. <laughs> I just kept writing. <laughs> well, that's a good, I find writing to be a bit cathartic and I'm going to start my, I'm going to write, I think some ebook guides was recommended for me and the book that I had planned on writing, which is what morphed into the podcast. Cause I thought, well, I can't write a book until after my mom is gone. And that was about three years ago. And I thought, at the time, it's going to be a lot longer journey, so I should do something else. So I did. <laughs> and then it wasn't that long a journey at the end with her. I mean, 20 years was a long time, but she yeah. lived three years and two weeks past my dad. So we, we expected it to be significantly longer. So it's, mm -hmm. that's one of my goals, but I'm not, I'm working towards having the time to do it. And, but I'm not, putting a lot of pressure on myself because life has been insane as it is. You know, there's just mm -hmm. been a lot of upheaval and a lot of loss. And it's like, I'm being kind to myself. Good for you. Which there are days that's hard, but you know, we all get through it one way or the other. And I, I like how you said you were going to be your own good fairy. And I love the phrase caregiving is love in action. That's just beautiful. Oh, good. Thank you. Well, I appreciate this and I will have links to all your books in the show notes so people can just click the hot link and order them because I've been reading them and they're fantastic. And she does have a family caregiving guide that is a cookbook. And I'm going to get that one too because we love to cook in this house. So simple, tasty meals. It's kind of perfect for two people that whose schedules are never the same every day. So I highly recommend that one for everybody. And you have a last whiz pit bit of wisdom for everybody before we go. I think the, the only thing I could say is that you are stronger than you know. And when the time comes, uh, you can draw upon a wellspring of strength that is within you and uh, use it to your own advantage. And you do have the ability to create a new and meaningful life. Uh, and I'm living proof of that. And I have a happy life, I should. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.